little tickle in my throat today. I'm bringing my coffee up here, not trying to be irreverent. Um, I have a uh, question for you. I want you to give this a little, little thought today. If you had to, you were forced to, give your walk with Christ a score from 1 to 10, what would you put up there? I mean, if, if you know, somebody really asked you, and, and you, you know, maybe it was me, and I said, give your walk with Christ a score. One being low and ten being on fire, where would you score yourself? I mean, I don't think I ever really would put a ten in there. Sometimes a one probably would feel more appropriate. But don't just stop there. What about, what about the power of God in your life? The actual power of God in your life. If you had to score it from one to ten, would you ever get anywhere above a five? So I just wonder, I often wonder about this. Is our faith supposed to be living and active? Is it supposed to be powerful? Is it? It is. But often what we find is lukewarm. And sometimes I feel like the guy who has to kind of beat people to keep them on the carousel. Get back on the carousel. Well, what's the point of the carousel? There is no point in it. It just goes around and around, right? That's not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be something else. I feel like often our faith gets despondent. Uh, you know. And although we say we're Christians, I wonder sometimes if agnostic might be a better title. Believing, but eh, not that serious about it. I think sometimes we're confused about what's really supposed to happen. And I don't think the church has often helped with that confusion. I think sometimes we've cast confusion upon other confusion. But let's just go on for a little bit with the, the whole 1 to 10 thing. What about your prayer life? If you had to give it a score from 1 to 10, would it get anywhere near a 10? I don't think I get there often. What about if, what about if somebody says, do you understand the Word of God? Do you, do you spend time in the Word of God and do you understand it? Like application level stuff. Can you read something and say, okay, God, I get it. I get what you want from me. And go out and do it. Can you do that? Could you give yourself a score anywhere near, you know, a high number? See, I think this happens to a lot of people. I think we have a desire that's in us somewhere, but I'm not sure it gets fanned into flames. We know that we should share our faith, but then we get fear and we don't do it. Uh, or maybe we're just too busy. One to ten. Do you sense God's guidance in your life? When you pray, do you sense what he wants from you? Do you hear him? See, a lot of times I think what we have is more like this cardboard box. It has some substance, right? I mean, it's here. If I hit you with it, you know, you'd feel it hopefully. It wouldn't hurt too bad because there's not that much to it. But it is here, but it's super empty. And you could do a couple things with it, but you can't do amazing things with it, could you? And I, I think cardboard Christianity might be what we often have these days in the United States of America. Now, there's other places in the world where it's anything but cardboard. And there's certainly churches in the United States where it's living and active and growing. Get me, don't get me wrong. I believe that's true. But often I think we're closer to this than we would probably readily admit. Amen? Um, today, you know, I'm going to preach something. I'm going to call it Come Alive. I struggled with exactly what to call it. But, uh, you know, I know that the word says this, that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they might have life. Abundant life. And so I'm not putting those verses up today, but that's kind of where it comes from. Come alive. Satan wants to confuse us. I think Satan, if he can't stop you from giving your faith to God, you know, I mean, that's an act of God anyway. But he can make you sure that you don't ever reproduce, right? He can confuse things and make them difficult. But Jesus says, no, no, no. That's not why, I'm, why I came. I came to give you life, abundant life. And not so you can get to heaven one day. So you can have abundant life now. 
And I fear that a lot of Christians have the kind of faith that says, oh yeah, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. Yeah, but what the H-E double hockey sticks is going on now? Right? If he didn't come to give us life now, then I don't understand the Bible at all because I'm sure that's what it says over and over and over again. Um, Would it be better? Would it be better for you if Jesus was with you every single day, all day long, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep? And then he was there as you sleep. Would it be better? I see a couple heads going like this, and I see some going like this. Well, what if he was with you in a contentious meeting at work? Could he help guard your mouth? What if he was with you when you were traveling from here to there, like maybe in your car? See, I think immediately we say, yeah, that would really help. That would really help. But it didn't help the disciples. There was a seriously contentious meeting in the Garden of Gethsemane, one of the most holy places that we consider holy today, right? Right outside the temple. And there was a meeting there between Pilate's people and Jesus' people. Did it go well? No. Peter took a sword and tried to split a guy's head in half. And Jesus was standing right there. It wasn't good enough. When they were traveling, things happened too. They would get in arguments. Who just went on a spring break trip? Their kids didn't get in any arguments. Anybody? Right there in the car, I don't even think it would help. Here's the deal. They still got in stupid arguments. They still got rebuked by Jesus. Uh, like I said, Peter's trying to behead somebody. And Jesus said, no, you don't understand. It would actually be better if I wasn't here. It would be better if I left. Because when I leave, then, John 16, 7, it is better for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And so Jesus answers the question right there. It is what? Better that I go away. And so here we are in a church and we say we believe. Amen if you believe. Amen. Okay. But what about the rest of it? Does anyone feel like or sense that there's something missing from their faith? Anybody put a 10 on any of those things? Well, I think we're called to live 10. Look at the disciples. Look at the apostles in the upper room. There was just a few days earlier, 500 people saw the risen Savior at the exact same time. 500 of them. They, it's written in the scriptures. They all saw him at the same time. How many were in the upper room when the Pentecost came, when the Holy Spirit came? 120. 500 saw him. They saw him and believed, hopefully. I don't know if they did, but that's the understanding I get from it. But only 120 did what Jesus said. Go and wait. Wait for what? The Holy Spirit. Wait for the Holy Spirit. Were they already clean? Well, we know that Peter was. We know the disciples were already clean, right? He said, you're already clean. You don't need anybody to clean you. But now go and wait for the Holy Spirit. This is, uh, this Holy Spirit is is confusing, but uh, when Jesus said the advocate, you could translate that paraclete. Who's ever heard that? Paraclete. Okay, so we have the paraclete. It's a counselor. It's translated lots of different ways. Counselor, comforter, advocate. And literally it means one who is called to, to the side of another. So like if you're in a hospital bed and you said, would you, just send, would you just send my wife? Would you just send my wife? I just want her with me, at my side. That's kind of the picture that you get. And also, not just there, but to counsel and support for the other person's needs. And so when Jesus said, I'm going to go away, I'm going to send this person, it's somebody specifically to do something for us. But here's the problem. Today, when somebody is filled with the Spirit, they're thought to be weird, yes? Yes. Yes. Well, that person's filled with the Spirit. Sometimes we say it, you know, in a good way, but most of the time it means they're liberal. 
you know? Or they're freaky weird. Or they just won't shut up about Jesus. I saw a lady one time in the bank. She was trying to, you know, the lady was trying to get some money or get some money. And she goes, are you saved? Are you saved, lady? And the lady, the bank was like, well, um, uh, I'm trying to get your money. No, but are you going to hell? Or are you going to heaven? And I know people who say, well, she's just filled with the Spirit. Oh, it sounded like she was filled with obnoxiousness. I don't think that's the Spirit of God. I think the Spirit of God is gentle and active and all those kinds of things. And maybe there would be a time when you would be very bold. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes very bold is important, but sometimes I think that's not what happens. We look at these people and we say, oh, they're just off the edge, man. Uh, If the Holy Spirit actually did what we just said, if He blew in here right now, swirled around, would anyone have any reason to fear Would we? We would not. Because Jesus and the Holy Spirit are identical. They have different jobs, but they're identical. And see, I think what we have is, well, you know, I want to be saved, but I don't want to be like one of those weird people. Listen, I don't even think those people necessarily are spirit-filled. I think there's a lot of stuff that goes on that is not God. First of all, fear is not of God, is it? Oh, so then why would we fear the Holy Spirit? I know why. Because we know that it would actually cause the death of some things that we hold in closets. We have candy, you know. If chocolate's your thing, maybe I'll make that little imagery for you. Got a little chocolate, you know, we go and we nibble on it. We savor it by ourselves. And we know that if the Holy Spirit comes in, He's going to say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to come into your life when you've got all these areas that you don't really want me in. That's not how He works. I'm going to get into that stuff in a few weeks, but I just want to leave that out there and just let you think about it. Uh, let me say this. I believe this is scriptural. I believe it's biblical. And so I'm going to say it. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is normal. It's absolutely normal. It is not only normal, it is expected. It is expected. And it is required. There's no way that you can walk with God in any kind of number 10 kind of a way, if you will, without having the Holy Spirit guide you and give you life where there once was death. It, in fact, I guess was mandatory. And so the opposite is also true. To be without the Spirit, I think, is hopeless. I think it's, it's, it's not hopeless in the sense that you won't get to heaven one day. I think it's hopeless in the sense that you can do anything for God or that he could work through you. This week I had something interesting happen. I got this little goatee. I've had it since I left the Air Force. And uh, I, I got this clipper, you know, to try to keep it looking good. Well, this week it decided, it's been limping along. You know, I charge it and, you know, just go a little bit. Well, this week it gave up the ghost. <laughs> It's hopeless. It is done. I mean, I charge it all night. I charge it half the day. You know, I won't even turn on. And so what good is it now? I mean, I could use it for ice pick, maybe. Would it make a good ice pick? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, kind of. I think it would probably break and some cheap stuff. I don't think it would be a good ice pick. It's certainly not a good razor. So what power... Could it really have? I mean, what function could it serve? It has become, if you will, powerless or impotent. Impotent at what it's designed to be. There's some amazing engineering in here. If you pull this thing open, I mean, this thing is actually really pretty cool. Lots of engineering and on and off switches and some chrome, some shininess. I mean, this is cool, right? Or is it worthless? You know, I don't know if this makes any sense here. I know it's just a simple analogy, but that shaver, it can do nothing. And I, I, not only do I think we're impotent and powerless, but I think we're lonely. We know that there's more to faith. We know it. We get on our knees and we pray, and we're not sure if it's making it out of the room. We're, we, we talk to God, but we're not sure he's really listening because we have doubts and all kinds of stuff. And so I think we get lonely. God, speak to me. Talk to me. Help me. Show me a disciple who was actually filled with the Spirit who ever had those problems. No, they they knew where they were going. 
There weren't some bad days, there were bad days. But they knew where they were going because they didn't have a cardboard Christianity. It was living and active and it was filled with water and all kinds of stuff. And they were weird, but in a good way. They were weird when you stood them up next to the society who didn't know God and didn't care. But they weren't weird in the sense that they weren't doing God's work. You want to call me weird for doing God's work? Hey, whatever. Call me a freak. I don't care. That's fine. I, I want to give you an illustration. Now, there's uh, lots of scriptures that kind of point this out, what happened. But just use your memory here for a second. Jesus went out into the desert to be baptized, Right? He went on to the desert to be baptized. Who was baptizing out there? John the baptizer, okay? And so there's a little discourse, and Jesus said, you know, I want you to baptize me. John's like, uh-uh, no way. There's a lot of conversations, too, because then John's followers were like, why, why are you do, what, wait a minute, you baptize him, and then now everyone's following him. Why aren't they following you? You're losing followers. Oh, no. But John says, no, I must decrease, and he must increase, right? And he said, I'm going to baptize with water, but there's another time, there's another one coming who's going to baptize with fire. With fire. And so here's what we got. This is a typical Christian, right? The typical Christian. Our sins be like Scarlet, they'd be like scarlet. And there's some imagery with the blood of Christ. And I, you know, I'm not talking about being covered with the blood. I'm saying our sins are like scarlet. We're supposed to be pure, but we're not pure. We're supposed to be white and holy, but we're not. We've got all kinds of problems. And so we are baptized. And what's supposed to happen is, right? Our sins are washed away. Our sins, though, they'd be like scarlet are now White as snow. They're white as snow. But that's what happened with Jesus, right? He, he didn't have anything to be washed away, clearly. But what happened after he comes out of the water? Did he just get baptized? Yes. And what, he, what happens is the Holy Spirit comes down on him like a dove. Sometimes it comes like a dove. Sometimes it comes like fire. And then God speaks and he says, this is my son in who I am well pleased. So right there you have the Father speaking. You have the Son being baptized by water and then by, by the Holy Spirit. And you also have the Holy Spirit right there. The triune God all right there. Why would we stop and be happy with just having our sins paid for? That seems a little one-sided, doesn't it? Hey, I got mine. <laughs> I'm good. No, it seems like it would be not right, and it isn't right. What Jesus did after he shows himself to all these people, he says, go and wait in Jerusalem. Like I said, they were already clean, but they were told to go and that a new life was coming. A better life was to be expected. That whole born again thing, he basically says, I really meant that. You're going to be born again. It's like you're going to be this person, a bumbling kind of a dummy, you know, as Peter often was, and all of a sudden, you're going to be like the first pope. You're going to be over here saying all kinds of dumb things and doing all kinds of dumb things. Boom, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you, and you're going to take on the world. Over here, you're going to be afraid. You're, you're hiding. Over here, you're like bold. And that's what's supposed to happen. New life. There's more than just saying I believe and being baptized. They were changed immediately. And they were changed permanently. So if I was to take this towel here and lower it into fire, would it be the same when it came out? No. It wouldn't be. Now, a towel or a piece of paper or something like that would be consumed. But we can't be consumed in that sense. But we would be forever changed. Like a melting pot, right? You put the metal in and there's some... Fire goes on, and then you scrape, scrape off the dross. That's what's supposed to happen. The Holy Spirit comes in. But you cannot be the same. Then how is it so much that we say, oh, you believe, you're baptized, good. Uh, that's all you need. Well, I feel the same. <laughs> well, you shouldn't feel the same. And you should never be the same. Um, the traditions where I was ordained... Uh, the traditions and uh, really even the doctrine of most Protestant churches, with some exceptions, shun the Holy Spirit. We shun the Holy Spirit. 
We are told in the same scriptures not to treat prophecies with contempt. We're told not to do that, and we do it. As soon as somebody starts to prophesy, we're like, hold on, man. Now, I'm not saying that all that stuff that happens, you know, that, that things shouldn't be organized, they should be. Uh, I'm just saying, listen, I believe there's more, and I read the same scriptures that everyone else reads, and there's tons of examples of the Holy Spirit coming on people and changing them. Amen. And so what I want to say is the Holy Spirit, or if you will, the paraclete, is a person. He's a person. Just like the Father and the Son, but the paraclete is a person. He's a part of the triune God. And we don't need to fear him any more than we would fear anyone else. Um, is God one? Yes. Is he three parts? Yes. Is one part less or more than another? No. They're distinct. They're different. And yet, they're the same. And so if we wouldn't fear Jesus, we don't need to fear him. And I don't mean that demons shouldn't fear him. They should. And there's parts of us that we should fear, the things that we keep hidden. You know, we should probably fear that because God doesn't put up with stuff like that. I mean, he will root it out of your life one way or the other. That's what he needs to do to get us where we're going to go. Uh, but I will say that the Holy Spirit, I believe, is the most misunderstood, the most misused, the most maligned, and probably most neglected part of the Trinity. Would you agree with that? And I also would agree, or I would say, that I think a lot of churches distort the whole Holy Spirit thing. They misuse them. There's churches up and down the street here. I know one where people are, uh, you know, they lay around the altar. They, uh, they you know, somebody's got to come put a sheet on them uh, because they're laying around and flopping around. And then they're grabbing flags and they're running around, yay, and they're screaming and they're yelling. And one person's speaking in tongues, another person's speaking in tongues. The pastor can't get anything done. And I'm like, okay, this is this the Holy Spirit? Is this the Holy Spirit? Well, let me see. Who's getting credit? Who's getting credit for it? Well, they're saying it's the Holy Spirit, but often when I look at it, I'm just one Christian. I'm just, I know I'm a pastor, but I'm just one guy. I look and I say, you know, I think some of these people here, uh, something spiritual might be happening, but a lot of them are just showing off. They're just showing off. Look at me instead of look at him. And when that happens, it makes me suspicious. I also know that there's a lot of fake pastors there's a lot of fake evangelists, and they do all kinds of crazy things, like sell prayer cloths and have television channels. And they say, oh, you know, this is what you need, the Holy Spirit, and this is what will happen. And if you send me some of your money, <laughs> I'll send you something. And it always has something to do with that, right? And Jesus said, this is what's going to happen. Many are going to come after me. They're fake. They're liars. They're false apostles. They're false prophets. They're false shepherds. They will feed on the flock. They feed on the ignorance of sheep. That's not the Holy Spirit. It just isn't. 2 Corinthians 11, 13-14. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. But when the Holy Spirit comes on you, friends, when the Holy Spirit really enters a room, you will know it. It will be undeniable. There will be no doubt about it. That is an act of God. You will know it. And so if it's suspicious, I think maybe that might be the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you know what, this is a little suspicious. You might want to fear it. Let me ask you this. If Jesus actually came in the room right now, walked in, hands scarred, feet scarred, side scarred, if he walked in, what would happen? I read a book not too long ago, and it says that Jesus was invited, or if you will, a guest speaker was invited to a big church, and the guest speaker showed up late. Not only was he late, but he was told to be there on time, but he was dirty. He had grease on him. And they, they said, you know, you're supposed to be here a long time. And they usher him into the little side office where the pastor's at, and, you know, and they're talking to him, and they hand him the order of service, and they hand him the bulletin. 
And they're like, can we get you a new, you know, new suit? No, no, my suit is fine. They didn't get it at all. Well, he had stopped on the side of the road to help some poor little old lady whose car had broken down, right? And he didn't have a towel, so he wiped it on himself because he wasn't worried about that. And the little bulletin they gave him, he just kind of set it down and chuckled a little bit. And when he walked out into the room, all of a sudden, somebody in the front jumped up and screamed, Wah! and ran out. Somebody else jumped up and said, what are you going to do with us? What are you going to do with us? And somebody way back in the back started running, running across, running down the stairs. And all of a sudden, you see somebody else running in, and there's a huge embrace. A prodigal had come home. Do we need to fear that? Do we? Because if Jesus walked in, I think what would happen to the rest of us is we would actually look at our life and say, wait a minute, are we, are we cardboard? Or is living water in us and pouring out of us? Are we living for ourselves? Or are we living for Christ? Are we on the stupid treadmill, carousel? Or are we actually out there with the spear, the word, the sword, and doing something? When we preach the truth, my friends, when we preach the truth, the real gospel, God is in it. He's in it. He's the guide of it. He's the helper of it. He helps people understand it. He's also our audience. And he also testifies to the truth. And you can smell it and you can know it. Look at this, 2 Corinthians. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 2.17, You see, we are not like the many hucksters who preach for personal profit. We preach the word of God with sincerity and with Christ's authority, knowing that God is watching us. And that's how we should live our lives. Uh, I have a dear aunt. I talk, talked to you recently about her. My uncle died kind of unexpectedly. She, um, she and my grandmother went to Methodist church. And I remember the Methodist church when I was little because, you know, God sears things into your brain. One day, my grandmother accidentally slammed my fingers in the door of her, you know, old Chevy back when they actually had steel doors at, in the parking lot of that Methodist church. And I remember, you know, she felt so bad. I think my aunt was there. They took me down into this little room, and they were running cold water on my hand, and, you know, I was crying. But I remember that church because of that. My aunt told me some years ago that she left that church. And I asked her, well, why, why would you leave that church? You know, you've been there your whole life, basically. And she said, you know, Jimmy, I just wanted more. I just wanted more. And so she went to the church down the road. And uh, I've been there a couple times. Uh, Aaron and I have been there. We met the pastor. I mean, he's about 75, I think it is. But I've been to a few services there. And I'm just telling you, when I was there, you could sense the Spirit. Not because people were getting attention, but because God was being worshipped and praised. One time I was there with my aunt, and we sat there, and I had my sermon notes ready to go. Typical, you know, ex-Baptist. <laughs> I got my pen. I want to have a lesson. The band played, and then they played, and then they played again, and then they played some more, and the pastor never got up. He never got up. Spirit guided, things changed. And I'm not saying that's how we should do it. I'm just saying it was refreshing. I left there without any notes, but I knew that I had an experience where God had filled me, had changed me. Anybody else want more? Are we content? That's why I'm preaching a series and I'm trying to set it up. For years now, I've been reading books about the Holy Spirit. Lots of them. A big stacks. I have read little teeny books by Tozer. I've read, I've read great big books. I've got theology books. I mean, I've gone all over. I'm not the doctor of the thing or anything, but I really have spent a lot of time looking at the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you this. I longed for more. Hello, Jessica. It's hard to sneak in when you always wear boots, isn't it? 
If you've ever wanted more, if you've ever sensed that there should be more, that is an act of God. In fact, Romans 3 says that if you're sensing that you're not okay, that, that there is a cardboard function to your Christianity, if you're sensing that that is not good and that there's more, that is the Holy Spirit himself. That is the paraclete talking to you, speaking to you. That's right. That's what it says. It says no one would seek God. No, not one would seek him. We're all sinners. We've all fallen away. And so even that sense that something is not right is God saying, please, please, do you hear me? If you could just get this stuff out of your life, I could change it. I could make you alive like you've never been alive. I could show you your real purpose. I could put power into this thing I've created that's supposed to be alive and doing things. And the truth is that Jesus promises that as a gift. He promises it. But only to a few. And it's not those that are spirit-filled. It's those who obey. Those who obey. John 14. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, who will never another as in not him who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. In you. So let's go back to our rating scale for just a second. On a scale from 1 to 10, how is your obedience And and I'm not talking about legalism. Friends, I hate legalism. It's generally just a cover for sin. When you start getting legalistic, it's because you're trying to point to other people so people don't look in here. I'm talking about actual obedience. When the Holy Spirit says, listen, listen, you need to give. Do you obey? When the Holy Spirit says, you need to serve, this is an opportunity for you. It's going to hurt you. It's going to cost you, but you need to do it. Do you do it? When the Spirit says, why do you leave me in the mornings and you don't talk to me? Why don't you spend time with me? You know that you could be so strong in your faith if you would just spend time with me. Do you stop and listen and do? Or is the opposite true? Unfortunately, I think the opposite is also true. And so we have these spiritual roadblocks He's already in us. I'm not saying we're not saved. Don't write me letters. I'm saying that he can be with you, but he wants to come in and animate you to make you alive, to get those spiritual gifts going that you already have, and to make you the person he wants you to be, that he made you to be. John 14 Fourteen twenty six. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Paul said this to the Ephesians, and now in the first chapter, and now you Gentiles have also heard the truth. So it wasn't just the Jews. The good news that God saves you. Amen. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit. And what that means is he set his seal upon you, identified you, he marked you with his spirit. And so your name is in the land's book of life, right? But then he goes on. The Holy Spirit who he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. But we are a lazy, lazy people, are we not? We are lazy. I mean, we're not lazy when we're chasing donuts. I mean, I ate two of them this morning. It's not even on my diet. And we're not lazy when it comes to, you know, I know buddies of mine would never get up in time to go to church. I mean, 11 o'clock, are you kidding me? Buddy, they're on the golf course, 6 a.m., 
They'll cry by going to work at 9 or 10, but they'll do something they want to do. Where are all my fishermen? 4 a.m.? You're sleeping into 4 a.m.? It happens in our faith more than we want to admit. And it's not just us. Paul, who we often quote, kind of gave Timothy a hard time about it. Timothy got lazy. Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, I remember your genuine faith, Tim, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mom Eurus. Not Eurus, Eunice. And I know that your same faith continues strong in you. So he's not saying you don't have faith, Tim. But this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, of love, and of self-discipline. When you see those things, then you know it's God. When you see laziness, even out of a believer, you know that the flames might be there, but they need to be fanned into flames. And what I'm trying to tell you is, I believe, as a, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, as somebody who's saved, that there's, there's a spark. But we have a responsibility there, just like Timothy did, to fan it into flames. And that's where we get lazy. We don't. We don't because we know the flame will consume us. Not, not consume us as we would disappear, but consume the things that we want for our lives, our hopes and our dreams for our future, our children's future, our grandchildren's future, where we want to live and where we want to go. That would cease to exist. And what would place it is what God invented you for, what God made you for, that workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good things that you don't even know about, but that he made from the beginning of time. That's what would happen. I got a quote by Tozer. I, I try to find it, but I, it doesn't matter because I know it. He said this, you may not be as full of the Spirit as you desire to be. And you may not be as full of the Spirit as you ought to be. But friends, you are as full of the Spirit as you want to be. If that condemns you, then I believe that's God. One of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of our sins and to say, no, you know that's not right. You know it's cardboard. You know your walk is not good. That's God. And it's not a horrible father. It's a good, loving father. Nowadays, if you correct your children, oh, no, what a horrible parent. Listen, I correct my children daily. That's what they need. It's love. And they know I love them. And if you fail to do it, then you're not loving. And so God does it as well. Well, that's the end of my setup. Let me tell you where I'm going. Um, like I said, I read a lot of books. Uh, I've argued with people, uh, Protestants, Catholics, Pentecostals. I've taken walks. I've gone to other churches. Sometimes you don't even know this. I go to Pentecostal church. I've gone to Assembly of God churches. I just stand in the back and I watch and I listen and I try to, you know, learn a little bit. And often I do it because I have no responsibilities there. And I can just praise and worship and not worry about the order of service. But what I would like to do is to, to, to take you guys on a walk. And one of the weeks I have laid out will be roadblocks. Things that we do that I believe block the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. I have a whole list of them. And so you'll see that it says the sermon series starts April 3rd, which really started on April 10th. I don't know when it's going to stop. Uh, Aaron, if you want to preach one, if somebody's moved by the Spirit and you think you got something to share, let's seriously investigate this third person. I, don't, I have big theology books in my office, and I will not get outside of the faith, of the doctrine of the faith. I won't. And if I do, it's your job and elders' jobs to stop me. And tell me I'm wrong. But inside of that doctrine, I want to I dive in and learn, who, who are you, Holy Spirit? What can, what can we do to embrace you and let you fill us? Guys, you can come on up. Uh, let me leave you with this invitation. If, you, if you're not interested in this, 
then I suspect you probably should skip the next few weeks because that's where we're going to go. Uh, if you don't want to be convicted by the Holy Spirit, then don't come because I, I believe it will be quite convicting for most of us. But if you believe that there's more, if you believe that God really wants to give you something that's far beyond what it, if you ever even really asked or imagined, then I encourage you to come and to bring somebody because we're going to take a genuine look at it. All right? Father, thank you for this place to meet. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for just giving us life. God, I pray. And you know, Lord, I'm not just doing it for the folks here. I've prayed it a lot. Send your spirit, Lord. Guide us. Lead us. Uh, change us and use us. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.